Welcome to Flipped Classroom. Today's lesson will be introducing Girl in Translation, the first five chapters. The first question you may have when reading this book is, is it fiction or nonfiction? Well, that's kind of a tricky question because yes, it is a true story, but it does have embellishments. For example, it's nonfiction because the events described in the book are real. Then again, it's fiction because the dialogue and names in many cases are made up. For example, as you know, the author of the book's first name is Jean, but the main character that her life is based upon is named Kimberly. So when you're writing about this book, you would not want to refer to it as a novel because a novel implies fiction. Instead, it's probably more accurate to call it a semi-autobiographical work. When reading the book, you should keep in mind three questions. One, who is the audience? In other words, who is the author writing to? Two, what is the purpose of the book? Why is she writing about these specific events? And three, what is the tone of the book? What mood is the author creating? You can begin to look for audience purpose and tone in one of the key quotes in the prologue. The author writes, there's a Chinese saying, that the fates are winds that blow through our lives from every angle, urging us along the paths of time. Those who are strong-willed may fight the storm and possibly choose their own road, while the weak must go where they are blowing. I have to say, I've not been so much pushed by winds as pulled forward by the force of my own decisions. Some of the key words in here are possibly choose. In other words, while fate means we have a predetermined path in life, she points out that she has a choice. Her choices might be limited, so she says we might possibly choose our own road, the road being our path in life. But she also mentions that the weak do not have that. And when she describes herself, she's not saying she's pushed by winds. In other words, she's not weak, but she's pulled forward. In other words, fate does have a role in her life, but that fate mixed with free will has pushed her to making hard decisions. Spend some time looking at this quote in your book, trying to analyze what it means, and throughout the book, go back and look at it to see if you can make some connections. Another insightful event in the prologue is when Kimberly talks about ripping up the picture of herself then deciding to save those scraps and later joining them together. And this is what she says about it. My eyes still gaze directly at the camera. Their hope and ambition clear to all who care to look, if I had only had known. Key word being care, meaning not everybody saw her potential. Not everybody took the time to care about her. But she also says, if I had only known. Looking back, she's, she's writing this book from the adult standpoint, knowing what the future does hold, and reminiscing about how she was disappointed that at times as a child, she didn't have that hope. Let's take a look at chapter one. Chapter one sets up the question of where will I live and what will I do? The first person to speak in the book is Aunt Paula, who has brought them to an apartment that is well below living conditions. And Paula hopefully says, we will fix them, meaning the problems, together, because we are family. Think about, as you read, how much of a family member Paula is. What is her role in this family? Kimberly refers to her mother in chapter one as mother and cub. The connotation of cub and bear being protective, that they have a protective, nurturing relationship. She also notices in chapter one that almost everyone was black. This is different from a child from Hong Kong who has never seen African Americans before. Chapter one also introduces her mother, which she refers to as Ma, and we find out that her mother had tuberculosis, and that there's a jealousy issue going on between the mother and Aunt Paula. We also discover that Ma was a music teacher and a very successful woman in Hong Kong. So there's going to be a big change, a big cultural shift for her coming to the United States. We also meet Al, who's a store owner and one of the African American people in this book who shows great kindness to Kimberly and her mother.
The author also sets up a setting. We see the ugliest parts of New York City, which contrasts with the American dream. The hopes that Kimberly had of the Statue of Liberty and bright lights of Broadway instead are in a deep contrast to the dirty ugliness of the apartment she's going to live in. You also may want to pay attention to two key symbols in chapter one. One is the mother's violin. It is a connection to Hong Kong. It's a connection to her past. Also, when they set up their little apartment, they pay close attention to feng shui, the way they set up their apartment, as well as the Buddhist altar. Once again, symbols of bringing their past culture with them to the United States. One key quote to look at, starts with, the road we could follow in Hong Kong was a dead one, according to the mother. The only future I could see for us, for you, was here, where you could become whatever you wanted. Even though this isn't what we'd imagined back home, we will be all right. You can see this hopeful tone that the mother sets. She is disappointed, and there is an atmosphere of disappointment. But with that disappointment, she brings along a sense of optimism for her daughter in chapter one. In chapter two, we begin to see that education goes beyond the classroom. The first most shocking part is we find out that the Kimberly's education is established on a lie. Aunt Paula lies about her address to go to a, so she can go to a very specific school. Also going to school the first day, she's separated from her mother. This is a key theme throughout the book, is separation. We also introduced Mr. Bogart, the teacher, and we see his ignorance, his lack of tolerance for Kimberly's culture. In contrast, we meet the white girl who sits next to Kimberly, who's very tolerant. These two characters, Mr. Bogart and the white girl, set up a clear contrast between the type of people Kimberly will meet in the United States. Kimberly also experiences her first failure in school. In Hong Kong, she was the best and brightest student. In the United States, she is at the bottom, once again causing a culture shock for her. In this chapter, she goes to the factory, another form of education for her. Her Aunt Paula tells her that the girls in the factory, they enter at this table as children and they leave from it as grandmothers. This is the circle of factory life. Think about what that quote means and what the future for Kimberly holds if this is true. We also see that she learns about American culture through Chinatown, which is a merging of her home culture and the new culture. Matt, who she meets in the factory, is a child who is going to help bridge this cultural gap for her. Also in this chapter, we see that Kimberly decides to skip school. This suggests that she's rejecting this new educational system. She's rejecting this new way of life. She's not ready to accept or embrace American culture. And while she's at home, she watches a lot of TV, which portrays American values. This is one step for her assimilation. Kimberly says to herself, I would find myself on the trains to the factory by accident, as if they were the place to which all roads lead. This quote sets a sad tone, that she feels at this point her life will be working in a factory. And no matter where she goes, it ends up on routes that lead to a factory, a place that represents hopelessness, suffering, and lack of opportunity. In chapter three, she contemplates what kind of future does Kimberly and her mother want? She has two models. One is Matt, who works in the factory, and the other is Annette, her classmate. Kimberly starts the chapter by saying, my predominant memory of that phase of my life is of the cold. Think of the author's word choice, cold. What kind of tone does this set? The mother also gives her a warning in this chapter. If you play with them, learn to talk like them, study like them, act like them. In 10 or 20 years, you'll be doing precisely what the older girls are doing, working on the sewing machines in this factory until you're worn. The mother's very cautious about letting Kimberly interact with people of her same culture, fearing they will drag her down. But we will also see the mother's equally fearful of letting Kimberly 
associate with American children. The mother has a conflict deciding which future is the best for her daughter. By the end of the chapter, the mother says, I'm sorry I brought you to this place. I'm going to get us both out of here. This place, here. Think about it. Does she really mean America? Or is she talking about the specific situation they are in right now? These words, cold, them, place, here, they all, they are all words that help the author create a tone of despair, worry, and frustration in chapter three. Chapter four focuses on mothers. We have two mothers. We have Ma and we have Mrs. Avery, Annette's mother. Mrs. Avery provides this incredible home with fancy bedrooms, unlimited food, luxuries in many ways, whereas her mother can barely provide a home. We see the contrast between how Ma and Miss Avery provide their children food and bedrooms and rules. We find out that Mrs. Avery is what Kimberly said, a really state agent instead of real state agent. Once again, Kimberly is adjusting to the culture and her word choice and pronunciation is evident of this. Another way the mothers are contrasted is in gift giving. We see the importance in both cultures of giving friends and teachers a gift. We also see the cultural ceremonies, Mrs. Avery and her celebration of Christmas and Ma and Kimberly's celebration of Chinese New Year's. As Kimberly reflects back on this time in her life, she says, we found a true gift, several rolls of plush cloth. Ma made us robes and sweaters, pants and blankets. She used it to cover parts of the floor and windows. She even made tablecloths. We can see from this that the mother, we can see from this that both mothers are providers. It's just the level and ability to provide is different. In chapter five, we see a more independent Kimberly, the independent daughter. At one point she even says, I would never have talked to Ma like this to openly argue with her. Kimberly's recognizing that she's changing. She's becoming this more outspoken, independent child, more like American children. And she says this is because I had never had the responsibilities there that I now did. I had never been so desperate to change our living situation. So in other words, Kimberly is saying that she's become Americanized, independent child because of the situation she's been put in. This chapter also explains to us that Aunt Paula has created sacrifices. This gives us a little more empathy for Aunt Paula and seeing her less as a villain. Another key scene is the fight with Luke. Kimberly takes the matters into her own hands. She doesn't seek the help of adults. Instead, she uses her independence to resolve the problem. All of this hard work and independence pays off for her when she's invited to tour Harrison Prep School. This is where she realizes that hard work, being independent, taking initiative is going to be her path to success in the United States. But once again, she's confronted with another culture. She thought there's one American dream, one American lifestyle, Looking at Harrison Prep, she realizes there's a whole other America she has to learn about. So in review, when looking at chapters one through five, begin asking yourself about the audience, the purpose, and the tone. You will see that the audience at this point are people who are open to learning about the immigrant experience, people with interest in the American dream. It also gives the audience a glimpse of another side of America. The purpose at this point could be showing that the American dream is alive and the values of sacrifice and hard work are the paths to the American dream. The tone in these chapters shifts from misery to hope and back and forth. And all of that tone will help the audience understand the purpose of this book. I hope you enjoyed reading chapters one through five and look forward to sharing some more information in our next Flip Classrooms. Thank you for joining me today in Flip Classroom.